Once again, Western media has made a mistake in analyzing China's economy, but this time it could affect the future of the US dollar and even the future of the United States position in the world. Let me explain. Every day, Western media bombards you with stories predicting that China is about to collapse at any moment. Time magazine says that China's economic slump is here to stay. Meanwhile, foreign policy states that China started the new year with an economic hangover. But earlier this week, the economic data from China's first quarter came out, and it turns out to be much different than what we've been told. On Monday, CNBC reported China's economy grew 5.3% in the first quarter, beating expectations. The growth was driven by external demand, as export volume grew by 14% year-on-year, in addition to robust growth in high-tech industries. This means that despite efforts from the West to decouple from China's economy, China is very much still a dominant player in the world economy. In fact, Morgan Stanley even raised its 2024 real GDP forecast for China to 4.8% up from its previous expectation of just 4.2%. Now, don't get me wrong. There are still major challenges in China's economy. But what if our media and politicians are focusing too much on China and ignoring the massive problems building under our own house? Earlier this month, Bloomberg Economics ran a million simulations on the future of U.S. debt, and 88% of them indicate one verdict for the U.S. economy. There is a major debt problem ahead. This is actually a major story that simply isn't getting enough press, because once again, the media wants to distract you and have you worry about China instead. But let's break down just how fast the U.S. national debt has been growing and what it means for the future. There were two major events that skyrocketed U.S. debt. The first was the 2008 financial crisis, which began with the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. And the second was the COVID pandemic. The future doesn't look promising either. As the Congressional Budget Office warned, the U.S. federal debt is on a path for levels of debt not seen since World War II. But what does this really mean? It simply means that as the U.S. government prints more dollars, the U.S. dollar becomes weaker and his reputation on the international stage declines. In fact, this Bloomberg article says the hard part out loud. The erosion of the dollar standing would be a watershed moment, with the U.S. losing not just access to cheap financing, but also global power and prestige. To help us break down these trends and analyze what's really happening in global markets, let's welcome special guest Kevin Demerit, the CEO of Lear Capital, to help explain what this means for the future of our global economy and what other countries, including the growing BRICS alliance led by China and Russia, are doing to combat these risks. Well, everybody, as promised, I want to bring in the CEO of Lear Capital. This is Kevin Demerit. Kevin, how are you today? Great. Thanks for having me, Cyrus. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's so important to bring in some experts as we try to analyze what's going on in the United States, certainly when we're looking at this U.S. economy. And Kevin, I'm quite concerned about this Bloomberg article that said they've run a million simulations and 88% is really indicating that there is going to be a very big problem ahead. One verdict for U.S. economy, debt danger ahead. So why don't you, can you break that down for our guests here today and talk about this rising level of debt? I mean, we're seeing $1 trillion added to the national debt every 100 days, roughly. What is that going to mean for our future? Yeah. So, you know, Cyrus, the more money the government prints, the less our dollars are worth. So when you hear everyone talking about, or we're going to lower interest rates, you know, maybe it's longer or, or higher for longer with, with, with interest rates. That's really what they're talking about. We're adding on so much debt that the definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. That's what we have happening. So you're probably going to have inflation higher for longer. But right. what does that mean for us? Since 2020, 24% of our purchasing power for every dollar in your wallet, for every dollar you've saved for retirement has fallen by 24%. No. People are feeling it at the grocery store. They're feeling it when they when they fill up their car. They're feeling it just almost everywhere, you know, within the economy. So if you can't stop the debt from going up, then you're going to have your dollar become worth less and less at a trillion dollars every hundred days. Three and a half trillion a year is right. what the government's adding on for debt. And it's impossible for them to stop printing money. Mm. That is just wild. What, what, I want to learn more about this, you know, from the interest rate perspective, because, for example, you know, uh, Powell has said that he wants to cut in, interest rates multiple times. But, you know, there's a lot of speculation into if that's ever going to if that's even going to happen or how that's going to happen. How is this also going to affect, you know, markets and again, this continuation, the devaluing of the U.S. dollar? 
Well, I think interest rates, you know, you get the 10 year up just a little bit more and stocks are just going to start having a, a, a very difficult time. The real estate market, everybody understands the commercial real estate's having a tough time. You'll start to have more problems, you know, on the on the single family homes and, and multifamily apartment buildings, things like that, because interest rates are just such a driver of additional money coming in either one of those markets. Right. I don't think he can lower interest rates three times this year anymore. Just, right. you know, inflation has been very sticky, won't go away. And unless they pull back on the money spending, which I just don't see them happening in this election year, then you're just going to have interest rates higher for longer. And so you start talking about this in June when that first interest rate drop was supposed to happen and it doesn't happen, right. then you get the fluctuations in the market. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I saw the other week on a headline, it was, it was talking about commercial real estate and they said there was a building, I forgot which major city it was, but that had sold for, it was a large commercial building. I think 10 years prior, it sold for, you know, over $300 million and they just sold it for under 40 million in about 10 years time because the commercial real estate is just, it's just being driven down to the ground. I mean, people have gone more remote you know, the interest rates are crazy. It's just, it's, it's just wild to see, you know, these parts of the, these segments of the economy just completely fall apart. Yeah. Look, I just, I just re up my lease in our building. We have a, a half a floor here. This building is almost 20% vacant. So right. here's the problem that the commercial buildings are having. You know, we have so many people working remotely that at some sort of vacancy rate, 20% plus the banks just aren't going to relend on that building. Right. So either the company who owns that building has to put down more money to get them back into, you know, their bank loan to value ratios that, that need to take place or give up the building. Right. It's just that simple. So people are saying, hey, look, I just need to sell the building and get out of this thing if I can mm -hmm. uh, for whatever I can get because I can't get a loan on it and interest rates are higher and lease rates are lower. It's not a good situation. But I had an article here and they said, a trillion and a half dollars of commercial real estate debt is maturing by 2025. Right. So if people believe that the banks are nice and safe, the banks that are making big, have made big loans on commercial real estate probably are still going to have some problems. Right. Oh, it's definitely a big one. I, I have an office as well. And, and I think vacancy rates are definitely over 50% where I am at here in Las Vegas. It's, I mean, they're, it's a, it's a WeWork facility, which did go, I did file bankruptcy. And I mean, they're basically throwing every incentive they can to, to, you know, rent a new office. If you bring a, you know, it's a $5,000 commission. If you can bring in a referral to anybody that wants to re lease a place and, you know, half the place is empty, you know, it's just, oh. uh, just wild. So I want to kind of shift this more to a geopolitical sphere here, because, you know, on our channel, we talk a lot about geopolitics. We're talking a lot about China and I think one of the interesting developments is certainly BRICS. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. BRICS, is, BRICS is a very interesting development, you know, that continues to grow. They added to five new members in, you know, January 1st. There's a lot of speculation of new countries that potentially could be joining in the future as well. And, you know, just last month, you know, Putin and the whole Russia had announced that they're going to be developing a new currency. It is, in fact, going to be backed by gold that's going to have some crypto and some blockchain elements to that. So it's really going to be cutting edge. And I think we're also starting to see, Kevin, a lot of countries around the world starting to trade outside of the U.S. dollar. You know, certainly within these BRICS communities, we know we've certainly seen China and Russia, you know, doing a lot of business together, certainly not using the U.S. dollar for that. Um, but with this dollar becoming, I mean, that's just amazing, 24% less purchasing value since 2020. That's not far, not, not that long ago. What, what do you see in the geopolitical sphere with the rise of BRICS, potential new currency, and, you know, countries around the world kind of shifting away from the U.S. dollar. Yeah. So, you know, I really look for tipping points. And when, when you bring up these countries, when, when you look at the, the, the countries that are involved here, which is basically Brazil, Russia, India, China, South, South Africa, you add up those people and it's 3.2 billion people. Right. That's 40 percent of the entire world's population. You don't need to shift much to get to 50 percent. Right. And I'm just talking about those countries. There's 40 other countries that have kind of signed on or quasi signed on to this BRICS currency. Right. So you're going to get over that 50 percent. That's yeah. a tipping point for me. And when you listen to the last meeting and, and they quote, I'm going to quote this. They said the goal is to reduce this is for the currency. The goal is to reduce the economic and political dependence on the U.S. dollar. We want to create a new international currency replacing the U.S. dollar as a means of transaction. Right. That's what the goal was of BRICS, to replace the dollar. Right. If you add a gold component to it, like Russia did when we 
you know, put some sanctions on them and their dollar crashed. And then they backed a little bit of it by gold and it went right back up. That's right. The BRICS countries, if they do this or the BRICS currencies and the countries behind them, if they do this, in my opinion, will be the biggest transfer of wealth the world has ever seen. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because it's a great strategy. If everyone thought about our trillion, trillion and a half dollar trade deficit, and instead of trading in paper dollars, let's say we traded in all gold. Yeah. That would mean by the end of the year, I've transferred a trillion and a half dollars worth of physical gold to some other country that had a surplus. I've literally given them this valuable currency right. in exchange for a car, toys, things that go down in value. Right. If you want to take it to an extreme, we could say, let's transfer a trillion and a half dollars worth of land, U.S. property over to these countries. Right. Nobody would put up with that. But because it's just paper dollars, it's almost like, you know, Vegas, you're in a casino. It doesn't seem, chips don't seem like real money for a second. Right. The transfer of wealth, if you used a dollar or a gold to back those dollars would be absolutely tremendous and crush the U.S. dollar. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a goal, I think, of BRICS is to certainly come up with a currency to replace the U.S. dollar. And so much of it has just been politicized because, you know, we've seen, you know, there's been over 16,000 sanctions against Russia. And remarkably, I actually did a full breakdown in a video of this, is their, their kind of strategy to pivot, use gold, and then actually be able to freely trade gold in the market. And like you said, that, you know, they're, they're trading gold for you know, other assets or whatever they want to do, but essentially allows them to bypass all of these sanctions. So sanctions have been pretty much useless for Russia, you know, that, you know, against this, this war that they've been in, you know, that has only increased Russia's actual military strength. They're the strongest since the 1980s now. And it's very interesting to just see this pivot. You know, I remember uh, Brazil's president said, you know, I, I wake up every single day thinking, you know, how do we replace the U.S. dollar? You know, what makes it that it needs to be the U.S. dollar that is the one that we're trading on? So it's, you know, when you've got a lot of these major countries, you know, around behind it, it definitely seems the momentum is going in that way. And let's also not forget that, for example, crude oil, uh, you know, the BRICS community now has a very big seize on that as well. You know, they, they have a very big control of that. You know, Russia actually exports more crude oil than Saudi Arabia. You know, and so that's a fact that many people don't know. And, you know, what we've seen is Russia being poured in, you know, they're they're selling their oil to India. India's buying it up and huge loads. I mean, that's what's driving the Indian economy as well. So it's there's a lot of things, you know, going on behind the scenes that we're not really aware of. It's certainly not being talked in the U.S. media. Yeah, you bring up oil, but think about the gold market for a second here. Yeah. If they're going to back and buy gold, you need some gold reserves. If right. you look at all of the central banks, and there's been record amounts of gold buying for the third year now. That's Who's right. buying? Well, Russia has the third largest deposit of gold, right? China, they don't put out their central bank holdings, but they're either number one or number two. Right. You've got Brazil, South Africa, obviously huge. Every one of these countries has relied upon gold or has huge central bank deposits of gold at this particular point. So for right. them to back a currency is not a big stretch here to right. back some portion of it. Then you add in all these other commodities that have held value, like you brought up oil and so on and so forth. It's the perfect time, in my opinion, when you're printing up trillions of dollars of US currency, that's getting devalued and then bringing on a, a, another currency that people can rely upon that has value and will hold the value is where most people really want a reserve currency to hold in the US dollar is obviously not doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, let's kind of shift back gears here to, you know, what we're seeing in, inside the United States right now, because like you said, the United States, do the US dollar is not holding its value. We kind of see that with inflation, because there, there's also another interesting thing where, you know, Joe Biden, he likes to broadcast to America that, you know, we're, we're tackling inflation, everything's coming down, everything's great. It always makes me question that because it's like, you know, have you been to the grocery store? Have you, have you been to a restaurant? I mean, are you living in the same place that we are? Because that that is, you know, I mean, I think this is actually crushing middle America and certainly a large portion of this country that are just finding it, it almost impossible to, you know, not even live a high standard of life, just survive, you know, just because of inflation right now. Yeah, look, you can't print the kind of money that they've printed. So up until 2008, well, we had $8 trillion or so of, of debt. From 2008, to where we are today, 15 years later, we added another $26 trillion to get to $34 trillion. Every dollar that they print makes our dollar worth less. But here's what people don't understand. 
they can't stop printing the money. When you start printing these huge amounts of money, you can't just turn it around because you need to print up just interest payment on that debt at the very least. The interest payment on our debt right now is one and a half trillion dollars per year. But that's not counting all of the real estate and the loans you and I have as, as, as you know, regular people and corporations and so on and so forth. It's impossible for them to stop printing. So I give this example to people to give them some sort of an idea. If you believe your dollar is going to be worth more, here's the example that I can prove that it won't. Let's say you and I are on an island and on that island, the only thing we use as money is our shells. Okay. okay. And on this island, there are 10 shells. You somehow, Cyrus, we're the banker and you have all 10 shells. The right. banker got all of it. I, you know, yeah. not a big stretch. I'm an entrepreneur and I come to you and I said, okay, Cyrus, I have this great idea. I need all 10 shells. You listen to the idea. You said, that's fantastic. I'm going to lend you 10 shells and I'm going to charge you 10% interest for your idea. I said, right. fine. I grab the 10 shells. I go invest it into the market. My business booms and I have all 10 shells back at the end of the year. And I come to you and I said, man, the business did fantastic. Here's your 10 shells back and you foreclose on my business. Why? Because the 10% interest isn't available. You as the banker need to print that extra shell out of thin air so that I can pay the interest back to you. Right. If the government is printing money faster than the economy is growing, you're going to have inflation. And if they right. print it at the speed that they're printing it now, you're going to have more inflation. That's why you cannot lower interest rates. Inflation is going to stay higher for longer. It's just simple math. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And just to kind of give everybody, uh, I, I want to bring up just one article that I read this morning. I logged into CNBC to, to, to read this morning. The U.S. economy will see more things break in 2025 if the rates stay high, strategist says. And going back to this Bloomberg article, you know, a million simulations, I want to read you the opening paragraph from that because it's, it's quite amazing. It says the Congressional Budget Office warned in its latest projections that the U.S. federal government debt is on a path from 97% of GDP last year to 116% by 2034, which would be even higher than the levels in World War II. But they are warned, but the actual outcome is likely much worse than that. So, I mean, we just see a lot of momentum going here. And I like your insights, Kevin, because you you made it very clear. You know, this is not something that the government can shut down. You know, they can't just right. stop this. It's kind of a runaway train. You know, if, uh, you know, if you've seen those before, I mean, it, it's a very dangerous situation. How do you stop a runaway train? So I want to also also shift this because what's interesting is is as a result of this we're also seeing other things happen for example bitcoin you know recently hit an all-time high and we continue to see gold which obviously i know you're a specialty specialist in that but these are also hitting all-time highs so tell us a little bit more about these assets specifically gold as well and you know why is that happening and will that continue to increase yeah. So for gold, Bitcoin hasn't been around long enough to, to run these kind of analysis, but right. one very high correlation that gold has is to the U.S. debt. So there's a 92% correlation to the size of the U.S. debt to the value of gold. And it's been this way for the past 20 years or so. So if we look at the debt and then we project gold out or project the debt out one year, the price of gold should be around 3200 Oddly right. enough, I think it was Bank of America or Citibank, one or the other today came out and said, hey, the price of gold that we're projecting is around $3,000 an ounce. I don't know if they're projecting it. That's what it should be today or that's what it should be by the end of the year. But that's what the projection is with a 92% correlation on the gold to the debt. Right. The Congressional Budget Office has never been right with the projection ever. I don't think I've ever read it and said, boy, right. they hit it right on the nose. Right. And 99% of the time, if not 100 they're way too low. Right. The debt's always much higher. They projected a, a trillion and a half dollars for this year, and we're going to be at three and a half trillion. So that's how close they are. With Again, if you print more and more money, the value of paper currency goes down and the value of tangible things that you can't print like gold or Bitcoin go up because you're just, you have more money supply chasing fewer goods. Just think of it as if more money, you have an increased demand on a fixed supply, yep. you'd have an increase in price. Well, I can't print gold and the increase in demand is an increase in money that's right. chasing the gold and driving it up. At the same time, you have central banks around the world that are purchasing record amounts of gold. Well, hey, if I could go to my garage and print up paper dollars out of thin air like they can and go right. out and buy gold, I would do it as well, especially right. when I'm printing up as much as they are, because I know those dollars that I'm going to hold, they're going to be worth less, but the gold is going to be worth more. 
Right. That's why you're seeing that these large central banks are, are purchasing the precious metals and they're not day traders. They don't buy today to sell tomorrow. They typically hold 10, 15, 20 years at a time. Right. They right. understand that the money printing has an effect on tangible assets and that's why they want to hold more gold. Yeah. I think you're going to see more record highs on gold in the next few years. Yeah, I think so as well. And I mean, it's I think a, a great indication is these, like you said, worth repeating, these central banks around the world. I mean, it's not just one or two. I mean, we're seeing all these central banks. They set a record in, I believe, 2022. And then I think it was nearly matched in 2023. And then here we are this new year, you know, first quarter, that trend is continuing. Like you said, there's three years in a row, record amounts of central banks. And like you said, you know, they know something, right? I mean, they have these paper dollars, but it's like, hey, we should be buying, you know, a physical asset that's probably going to be worth a lot more and much safer. So Kevin, with that note, I do want to, you know, kind of shift a little bit more into specifically gold because Lear Capital, you guys are the experts. It's, you know, that's, that's who I trust to, you know, buy physical gold and make these kind of investments. So I want you to break down a little bit more about Lear Capital, but also I think you have like a special report. You know, do you have anything else that you want to share with anybody? I'd like to, you know, what our goal is always to provide value, you know, and that's, I think that's what people that watch this YouTube channel, they like these insights, they love these interviews like this. And it's always great when we can bring a CEO of a well-established, you know, entrusted company in to bring these insights. Yeah. You know, we have a special report called $3,200 gold debt and $3,200 gold with correlation that I was talking about. I wanted people to understand it and how long that correlation has been going on yep. because it's the best way to invest, right? If, if I have this historical re repeating correlation at, at over 90%, then we have to pay attention to it. So right. if people understand it, I think they can make better decisions on hey, I should invest in gold. And then where should I invest possibly in the silver market? So we go over that. How to place gold and deliver it physically to your home or how to place physical gold into your retirement accounts if, if people would like to protect their assets there. So we've got that special report. It's all free of charge if they give us a call at 800-489-6450 or go to learcyrus.com, L-E-A-R, cyrus.com. And, you know, I always love to do something special for, for listeners. I just love your program. Every person who either calls the number or goes to that URL, we're going to give a mercury dime. So the old 1930s through the 1950s, silver mercury dimes. We're right. just going to add one to anyone who requests the information. You don't have to purchase. There's no obligation at all. But just make it fun for people to actually hold a piece of silver, get them started in a little way. Nice. is our thanks for being on the program and, and love sponsoring it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think the the big the biggest thing is I, I appreciate your sponsorship, but it's it's what I love about Lear is that you are all about education, you know, and it, and what I always tell people is, you know, it's not a hard sell for me. You know, it's it's just more if you want to get educated, you know, have a call, you know, learn from Lear. You know, they've you've got to have so much information that is just so helpful, you know, and really trying to understand this market. So I really appreciate you again providing that value to our guests and the viewers of this channel who tune in for all these latest geopolitical insights. But I think it's incredible. It's a story that, you know, we'll continue to follow. I'm going to be going back to China this summer. I'm going to be, you know, vlogging there and kind of seeing what the economy is doing there. But it's interesting because, I mean, we just saw Janet Yellen uh, go back to China as well. And, you know, there's a, there's a big story there. You know, a lot of it is the, the fact that Beijing is selling a lot of that U.S. debt. They used to hold a tremendous amount, but they're actually selling off the debt and they're buying gold in record amounts, you know, for 16 straight months now. And so, you know, that I'm sure Jenny Yellen's going over there trying to say, hey, can you can continue to hold our debt? And, you know, I don't know if that's really going to be the play for China. So it's an interesting one. But again, Kevin, thank you so much. I'll give you the final word about the anything else that you'd like to chat. But again, thank you so much for your time and the amazing knowledge that you're giving everybody today. Yeah, you know, thanks. And, and you're right. It, it's, it's about education. You know, I love the program because it's about education. That's what we're about. That's why I want people to get this information first before they make any kind of a decision. Talk to your financial planner about it. Sit down with him. You know, we can send out two packages of people request. We always want the financial planner to be a part of this. Nice. So, you know, the education is very important. Love the program and I appreciate you having me on. Wonderful. Well, everybody, we're going to put the comments, uh, we're going to put all the details rather in the comment section down below and also the description. So again, if you're interested in learning more, simply just go to learcyrus.com. There's also the 800 number, 1-800-489-6450. So I want to thank you all for your amazing support. And Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right.